Uh, well, first of all, the ocean, it is one big ocean. You did say it, it covers 71% of the planet. It accounts for 97% of the water, 96% of the living space on the ocean, and it offers two thirds of the, na the value of all the natural services offered by the planet. So, you know, on and on and on. It, um, it also produces the oxygen for every second breath that we take. So, the ocean is pretty important to this planet. Um, in terms of the ocean and climate, in fact, it is the ocean that controls climate largely. And it's the interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean that uh, gives us the weather that we have, the climate, and uh, everything like that. Uh, in fact, as we become more aware of every day, uh, changes in the ocean are affecting our climate and in terms of variability for certain. And I believe the most recent event, uh, we consider Hurricane Sandy, who came through New York and New Jersey just a few weeks ago, and what kind of uh, changes that has caused and what kind of misery that has caused to many people, uh, then we're starting to see, well, yes, the ocean is controlling a lot and we should be paying more attention to it. Conversely, uh, as I say, uh, the changes in climate, the climate variability, is having impacts on the ocean itself. And um, for example, um, there is a saying that the ocean is hot, sour, and breathless. I think that's been uh, put forward by the Plymouth Marine Lab with, with other uh, colleagues, but, it, but it's true. Uh, in terms of uh, impact uh, with the warming planet, the ocean absorbs about 80% of the heat. In fact, the upper three meters of the ocean uh, absorbs more heat, has more heat capacity than the entire atmosphere. And were it not for the ocean, we would be suffering a lot more. Our temperatures on land and in the atmosphere would be much higher if it were not for the ocean absorbing the heat. What happens when it absorbs the heat? Well, a few things. Uh, one, uh, it expands, thermal expansion, and uh, this is causing sea level rise, of course. That has impacts on our coast, it has impacts on our coastal communities. In addition, uh, the, um, the heat, of course, the changes in temperature will affect uh, the species. And uh, at the same time, the increase in temperature will cause uh, uh, heating of the glaciers, melting of the glaciers. So this also contributes to sea level rise. Have we already seen significant impact on marine life, uh, coral reefs, that kind of yes. thing, because as a result of, of the warming of the oceans? Yes, there are events called coral bleaching, which we're seeing, which has been related to the rises, the uh, increases in uh, sea temperature, for example. So very definitely impacts. Uh, the sour I'll come back to, uh, but breathless. Uh, what ha is happening with the... Uh, with the um, climate change as well is the oxygen is, is being decreased in the ocean for a number of reasons. For one, a warmer ocean absorbs less oxygen, uh, but there are other things happening in there in terms of nutrients and whatnot, which also causes a decrease in oxygen. So we uh, went from the, in the 1960s to having 49 uh, what we call dead zones uh, in the global ocean. Uh, we now have well over 400. So this is pretty significant as well. Uh, many marine species, most marine species, cannot survive without oxygen. So they will be moving or they won't be able to survive. The more sedentary species will not be able to live. Uh, just as the name implies, a dead zone is a zone without oxygen or sufficient, sufficient oxygen for, for life? That's correct. That's correct. Of course, there are you know, varying levels, but dead zones we consider would have uh, almost no oxygen and would not be able to support life. So uh, again, this is significant, very significant. And then the sour is related to what we call ocean acidification. Now, ocean acidification is not by, caused by global warming. It's not caused by climate change itself but it is related to climate change in that it is caused directly by the absorption of carbon dioxide. And when the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide, there is a chemical uh, change whereby carbonic acid is formed. The pH of the ocean goes down. Uh, right now, we're about 30% more acidic than uh, pre-industrial revolution. And the projections are that by the end of the century, we could be 150% more acidic in the ocean. Now, it doesn't 
take a brilliant person to figure out that once you start messing with the pH of the ocean, that's going to have impacts all the way around. And more importantly, all of these multiple stressors acting in concert, in fact, produce synergistic effects. And um, we just don't know what, what is going to happen. There could be winners, but there will definitely be losers. So, so there's a great, obviously, <coughs> a great unknown there. So the ocean, in a, to a large extent, has done us a huge favor. The rest of the planet a huge favor by absorbing so much heat. Is it, even if we took action now, radical action now, are some of these effects reversible? Have we gone too far? When is the point at which we go too far? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't think we know that. But certainly, uh, the ocean acts like a giant flywheel, wheel, right? So it, it slows change as we move forward. But also, once we start making changes to try to rectify this situation, it will take a long time to recover. So it would be thousands of years, probably. Having said that, it's important that we take action now in particular on CO2 emissions. And if we stop now, we, we have a chance of, of not making ourselves 150% more acidic by the end of the, of the century. Um, and I think that uh, as we move forward, recognizing that the ocean, uh, not only providing climate services, but it also provides a lot of food for people, food security. It, it provides so many uh, biological resources for the production of uh, pharmaceuticals and all those sorts of things. If we lose these things, we as a species are going to suffer. So uh, I would like to come back to the whole notion of the need for education, education for sustainable development, which UNESCO leads, education for climate change. Uh, and we've just launched today an alliance for climate change education, and I made a plea in that me meeting Part of this education has to be about the ocean, the importance of the ocean to the planet, the importance of the ocean to climate, and what we are doing, what the climate is doing to the ocean, what we are doing to the ocean. I think that that is absolutely essential that we understand that. But you mentioned earlier that um, we don't seem to notice that. I was going to say, you made a very clear case for the importance of the ocean in climate change talks. How come it's so far down the agenda, it doesn't have the prominence that it quite obviously deserves in climate change negotiations? Uh, my theory is that it's out of sight, out of mind. And uh, I've often said, I believe that if we did a survey of all the capital cities of the world, uh, exclusive perhaps of the small island developing states, that the great majority are inland. And if you're not on the ocean, making your living from the ocean, enjoying the ocean every day, it's like I say, out of sight, out of mind, and uh, that's, that's critical. So I think we need to get the decision makers out to the ocean, <coughs> enjoying the ocean, recognizing how much the ocean does for us and um, how much it could do. But on, uh, on the contrary, what we are doing to it and how we are putting ourselves in jeopardy. Okay, thank you. You have a quote, I believe, yeah, to sum up the situation, if you can remember it. <laughs> yes, I'll try to remember it. It's an excellent quote by <laughs> Sylvia Earle, who is uh, certainly one of the most renowned ocean scientists in the world from the U.S. And she said, even if you never have the chance to see the ocean or touch the ocean, the ocean touches you with every breath you take, every drop you drink, and every bite you consume. Everyone everywhere is inextricably connected to and dependent upon the existence of the sea.